So this entire session is all going to be high powered information. India was very, very new to the word called as globalization. The origin of financial crisis was traced by the inefficient management, unemployment, population explosion. All these factors were hitting the government very hard. Invest yourself and make others to invest in your country. Good morning and welcome to the first session of chapter 3 and that's going to be on liberalization, privatization and globalization. One of the most important topics in economics that led to the revolution in our country. Because of this, we were able to make a superb economic progress and we were considered to be the most emerging and developing nation in the world. So let's have a quick look into the topics that we are going to cover today and this would be a very interesting session for us to know how the economy of India started improving. Moving forward, these are the topics that we are going to see today. We're going to start with the introduction. We're going to look into what were the crises before we started getting into the liberalization, privatization and globalization. Some of the backgrounds of how the entire economy started setting up altogether, the control measures, the new economic model, definitely a very, very important topic. And this is the turning point for the Indian economics to move forward. Liberalization, we are going to get into a deep view into it and a deregulation of industrial sector. So this entire session is all going to be high powered information where you are going to learn the different sectors, the different valuation and policies that led India to a new success altogether. Moving forward. So we are going to now try to understand the concept of a liberalization, privatization and globalization. Till the year 1990, Trust me, the Indian government did not try to come up with any new policy. They were very much satisfied with the factor that whatever they were doing was extremely good. But the year 1991 was a turning point for us because we started understanding the new economic policy that was needed to take forward the nation altogether. So that is one of the reasons why I would always say the concept of economics turning around and bringing India as the most emerging nation of the world. So the first thing itself, we will try to understand the background of reform policies that started in the year 1991. We will also try to understand the mechanism through which the reform policies were introduced. It was not so easy because change in economics or in any part of the world is not easily accepted. But then India took the risk, India took the pain of overcoming all the situation and we did it in a very successful manner. We will also try to comprehend the process of globalization. India was very, very new to the word called as globalization, but then we picked it up and we started emerging successfully in a period of time. We were also aware about the impact of reform process under various sector. The first time ever when India came back and said that, yes, we could change our ideology. We could change the way how we are looking into the core sectors altogether. Moving forward, the crisis in 1991, a year where India wanted to really start propelling altogether. It met with a very big crisis. What was the crisis? It met with an economic crisis relating to the extension and the extending debt altogether. The government was in such a bad position that they were not even able to make any repayment on his borrowing and the foreign exchange had almost come down very badly. So we were generally a maintaining an import petrol duty. We were not in a position where we could even meet the daily demands in terms of the foreign exchange. And we had to import petrol, we had to import every single necessity commodity altogether and the foreign exchange reserve in India had slipped down to a very very rock bottom level. Now if you look at the entire crisis or the entire scenario altogether, the Indian government was facing trouble because 
till now we had to borrow money and we had to develop the nation we never knew how to create a source of revenue for ourselves we never knew how to overcome from the debt crisis and start becoming a powerful nation by ourselves so we were in a situation where we were not able to understand recognize the various factors that could make us a powerful nation altogether we were there in a position where our revenues were slipping imports were going extremely high and the cash trap nation was completely facing a different challenge altogether moving forward the crisis was further complicated or compounded by the rising prices of essential goods very very important factor when it comes to economics because the essential goods what a common man needs on a daily basis those goods were rising up like anything those values were going up like anything and india did not find a solution at that point of time they were completely perplexed by the manner that how the essential goods prices were going up and how are we going to see the scenario altogether how is that we are going to overcome the entire exercise altogether so that was the time that was the need that was the factor for india to bring in something where they can liberate out of this economy and start growing forward so that is a very very important factor very very important scenario altogether now let's look further all these things led to the government to introduce a new set of policy a change in the direction of growth it's a very very positive thing that we are going to talk about because until now after all the problems we believe that there is some solution that needs to come up a solution which is a homegrown solution a solution which is inbuilt within us because of that solution we will be able to change the direction change the map of india change the growth of india towards a very very positive side altogether so that's why we stepped in in terms of understanding the liberalization privatization and globalization moving forward now the origin for this the background let's try to understand how did this start working together the origin of financial crisis was traced by the inefficient management of the indian economy in 1980s now this is not a political blame game that we need to understand but from an economy standpoint there were a lot of areas where the indian government was not able to manage the financial factors so what happened in the financial factor did we just eat away all the money did all the money go away from us or was it put into those sectors which could not give us return the actual fact was that the government was known for implementing the general administration and policies which were not that effective they were not able to give returns to the government they were not being able to generate revenue to the government and the sources such as taxation running for public enterprises all costed the government very high what the government was trying to do is that trying to emphasize more on the public sector trying to emphasize more on the sectors which was completely controlled by them and they spent a lot of money on administration on maintaining those offices the employees and they were more concerned about the protective interest they were just guarding themselves into that particular sector into that particular segment altogether and they were not interested in building up the economy so that is where you would start seeing that the financial crisis that started happening was pure only because of the mismanagement of funds now the expenditure was more than the income quite a very simple and important fact altogether when your expenditure is more than your income that itself signals loss that itself tells that you are not in a position where you can go further and take over so that is why the government was started signaling saying that they have to borrow money from bank especially from rbi and the other resources so that they will be able to run the system properly so this is what i would try to make you understand all about the factor that money was not being sufficiently managed properly managed and that was one of the reason the impact started hitting us 11 years from 1980 so right from 1980 till 1991 
India was just struggling with the factor that how to manage the money, how to take it forward altogether. So the borrowing activity started going up. The government started getting into a position where they were worrying how to manage the finances, how to take it forward. And then the system started collapsing in the entire brink. So that is where the government started thinking that we need to bring in a policy, a methodology through which we can overcome this difficulty and become a better economic nation altogether. Moving forward. Now, when we are looking at this situation altogether in the background, again, there were some problems which we need to look into deeply. The first one was the import of goods like petroleum, where we had to pay in dollars, not in rupees, from our factors that we were earning from our exports. So all the export money, whatever we were earning from our export was just going in form of imports. Why? Because we had to import petroleum, we had to import gas, we had to import the essential commodities, which was making us run out of cash. All the money that was earned in form of dollars was paid back to the petroleum and to the oil companies abroad in order to get our essential commodities done. Second factor, developmental policies required even though revenues were very, very low, the government had to overshoot its revenue to meet the problems. Now, what was the problem was that unemployment, population explosion, all these factors were hitting the government very hard. Which means to say that at one point of time, the government did not plan for its budget. The government thought that we would have sufficient income post the independence period and we would be able to solve any problem economically. But the reality was that the income was low and the expenditure was very high. The public sector unions were not being able to make that sort of profit where the government could collect the money and start taking it forward. So that was one of the reasons why the government of India was not able to match its revenue to the expenditure. And this led to the government to start borrowing money from RBI and from other institutions because they had to overcome the problems of unemployment and explosions in terms of the population growth altogether. So another big crisis for us in terms of managing the situation. This continued spending on developmental programs or our development programs are something which is very, very important for India. But then that costed the government very much because they always needed additional revenue for it. Now, this is the factor that we need to understand. For any country, in order to make a development, in order to make a progress, in order to bring in some better policies, they need revenue. And for government, at that point of time, they did not have additional revenue. They could not have an extra income that could make them effective, that could be invested in some policies or program. So the government had to overshoot its budget. The government had to borrow more and more money. And this led to a problem where the government was completely left in a cash crunch position altogether. Now, moving forward, we also need to understand in the background scenario that when the government was spending a large share of its income on the areas which do not provide immediate returns, such as social sector and defense. Now, if you look back in the economy sector altogether, defense is one sector which does not give return. Defense is purely an internal sector of the economy, which is being taken care by the government for the protection of the nation. Now, we don't go to war every day. We don't go to a fight every day with any of our nations or any of the bordering countries. But what we tend to do is that we spend quite a lot of amount on our every year annual budget towards defense. Now, that money that goes into the defense, the three forces that are being maintained by the Indian government is quite high. We roughly spend about 12% of our India's GDP on defense. Now, if the 12% or 10% of the money of the total budget goes into defense and there is no return out of it, automatically that's a loss to the government. Why? Because we spend huge amount of money in building the infrastructure for defense, in building up the weapons, the ammunition for the defense, but we are not making any productive use out of it. So the defense becomes an absorbing part of the economy, which just takes the money inside and it is not able to give back. Similarly, when you look at the social sectors, now, for example, when we talk about the social problems or the social sectors altogether, these are all 
all sectors which absorb the money and they will not be able to provide an immediate return because it takes a long time for them to understand to implement and then bring them into action but for India what had happened is that we had spent a lot of money on the social sector and on the defense which were not able to give money back to the government so the ROI the return on investment on these sectors were extremely bad which led to another crisis in the government the second factor the income from public sector was not really high which means to say that all the PSUs the government sectors like BHEL, SALE, HMT or you look at any of the government sectors altogether were not been generating that amount of returns in terms of revenue, in terms of capitalization altogether. But what was happening for government was that they were not able to give up on this industry so they were continuously infusing money into the system. They were giving money to all the public companies and saying that in order to remain on establishment, in order to protect the employment of the people working there, money was just poured into the sector. Now what did this lead into is that a high growing expenditure altogether. So the government was only spending money and they were not able to get a return out of the PSUs. The second factor, now our foreign exchange borrowed from other countries, we were borrowing foreign exchange and the international financial institutions where we were borrowing was spent on the consumption needs itself. Imagine a situation for a country, if it wants to finance its own consumption, it has to go and borrow money from IMF, from the World Bank, from ADB, from any other international financial institution because they had to take care of their own personal needs. So now for the country India to finance its own need, we had to borrow money. We were not in a position where we were self-sufficient, where we had our own foreign exchange, where we had our own reserves that could take care of the nation. We had to go to other countries, promote our country, borrow money and use that money for the consumption. Yet another crisis because that would lead to a lot of deficit in terms of revenue. Next, neither there was an attempt that was made to reduce such spending because we did not think about it, we did not have an option, we only thought that we have to spend money, we kept on doing it, nor sufficient attention was given to boost the exports. If we did not find out an ideology, we did not find out a method through which exports can be increased and imports can be decreased. We only thought that let us keep spending money, where is the solution altogether and we were just thinking about the factor that exports will automatically increase one particular day. So on the entire scale, on a large scale ideology, if you start thinking about this sector, about the backgrounds altogether, it was only money getting absorbed in the various sector, money getting poured into the various sector, but there was no return coming out. This led to a very bad situation for government of India and they had to come up with a new economic policy that could liberate them out of the situation altogether. So moving forward. Now comes the control measures. After all this problem, after all these challenges, what is the control measure that we wanted to bring in? The first thing is that India approached the IBRD, International Bank of Reconciliation and Development, popularly known as the World Bank and the IMF, saying that we need to receive $7 billion. We wanted $7 billion right inside because we wanted to reconstruct India. We wanted to rebuild India altogether. So the first approach is that we went to them, we openly told them that yes, our country is in crisis, we need $7 billion as an aid to promote India back. And we got that fund from World Bank and from IMF. So the first thing was that the financial financial inclusion, the financial money pouring in from the international agencies. For availing the loan, these international agencies expected India to liberalize. That is what was the challenge that India had to see altogether because they said that open up your economy, open up your entire system, welcome the world, welcome all the foreign countries, your company to your area, to your situations together so that you will be able to bring up the economy to the next level as far as possible. Remove the barriers, reduce the governmental controls, make the system more as an open economy then you will see the manufacturing going up then you will be able to see your revenues boosting up so the world bank and imf were two people who wanted to see india as an open economy they never wanted india to be a restrictive economy 
they never wanted India to be a protective country altogether. So their ideology was that open up, give more importance to private sector, promote performance. Don't try to promote just the public sector, but promote performance. If there are organizations which are performance driven, give them more importance. So automatically the economy will boost up. So that is why they wanted to reduce the role of government agency and remove the trade barriers. Please do not put any kind of barriers, any kinds of restriction. Give them an open economy. Make the ideology of making business easy altogether. And that's where India agreed to that policy conditions of the World Bank. And we came up with a new economic policy altogether. So this was the scenario because you got an awakening from the World Bank, from the IMF saying that you are a protected country. Come out of the shell. Start exploring the economic opportunity. Start seeing the world as a global village. Start seeing the world as a ocean of opportunities. Invest yourself and make others to invest in your country. Automatically, the revenues will boost up. Automatically, the exports will see a different league altogether. So that is where Indian government got a major boost and Indian government started thinking that going forward from the year 1991, we are going to create a national economic policy that will boost the country's export and make India come into the big league altogether. Now, moving forward, the new economic policy policy altogether. The new economic policy consisted of wide ranging economic reforms, no doubt about it, because the new economic policy is all about not just talking one sector or one zone. It is going to talk about various sectors, various platforms altogether. The thrust of the policy, the importance of this policy was towards creating more competitive environment. I would really like to bring in a lot of importance to this world called as the competitive environment because until now we were very happy, we were a complacent nation feeling happy about the fact of whatever we were producing. We were not trying to challenge ourselves. We were not trying to understand that there needs to be a competitive healthy environment where we produce and compete against the leaders. To give you a very simple example, the great Bajaj Auto Limited did not even have a marketing department till the year 1990-91. The reason is that Bajaj felt that we don't have to serve the world. We don't have to serve anybody. We are producing scooters and those scooters are selling up very well. They are the brand image of India. But then after 1991, when Bajaj started understanding that we had to compete with global brands like Kawasaki, like Yamaha and all those brands, the company started opening up its door. They started creating a marketing department altogether. The reason is that economically, if you understand, most of these companies wanted to see how their goods are doing well in comparison to the global brands, in comparison to the global market. So similarly, India started understanding that when you open the doors of economy, the competitiveness starts going up. You start understanding how your country country is doing in comparison to Japan, in comparison to UK or to USA altogether. So that is where the environment becomes challenging. The environment becomes competitive enough for you. So that is why by removing the barriers of entry and making the growth of the firms even more easier. The next thing, the set of policies can broadly be classified into two groups. One was on the stabilization factor, which is very, very important for us. And the second one was on the structural reform measure. Now, when we talk about these two words, stabilization and structural matter. So these two will really matter to an economy altogether. Stabilization means that you are going to balance the economy. You are going to bring a neutralization program altogether to the economy. So you're going to bring all your sectors to a balanced condition, to a position where they can able to stand on their own foot. They're not going to go into a loss. The second thing is that you're going to bring structural reforms, which means you are now going to build up on companies, on sectors where you haven't seen it before. So that is where you are going to see a two way, a two dimension growth altogether. One side, you are talking about balancing. The other side, you are talking about growth. So balanced growth, that is what we were trying to intend in terms of the new age policy altogether. So this is very, very important. This is highly 
very important in terms of understanding the growth of our economy moving forward. The new economic policy was trying to take the stabilization measures are short terms because they were one thing because we wanted to stabilize at a normal level at an immediate at an instant level and the structural reforms were at the higher level were at the long term because if you see at the stabilization factor we wanted to reduce the weakness altogether we did not want to just concentrate on strength we also wanted to see that if there are certain sectors in india which are weak let's say for example healthcare let's say insurance or let's say automotive sector we did not want these sectors to deteriorate further we wanted to control the weakness we wanted to stabilize the platform we wanted to go back and tell people that this is the sector where we are going to bring in certain normalization curves altogether and then we have developed the balance of payment bringing inflation under control we wanted the inflation factor under control we didn't want the prices to overshoot the budget and tomorrow the consumers getting into problem so we wanted to bring the inflation under control so that we wanted to destabilize most of the unwanted factors altogether we wanted every single sector to perform on the normal level at the first go the second thing is that we wanted to see that there was a need for maintaining sufficient foreign exchange reserves so this word is very very important as a country if you start looking the importance of foreign exchange that gives you a moral boost to your cash reserves altogether saying that there is a whole lot of export that starts working now the more the exports more the foreign exchange coming into the country and more the foreign exchange coming into the country there is a immediate boost to the economy because now you are having sufficient cash reserves and those cash reserves can be used for the developmental policies of the nation so more the number of dollars yen and pound rolling into the indian economy that gives a moral boost to the infrastructural as well as to the different reforms that india can take forward in the coming years now moving forward liberalization what is the concept of liberalization altogether when i use the word liberal itself it means that i am trying to make myself even more softer even more systematic and even more simpler altogether so i don't want to be strict i don't want to be harsh i just want to be a simple and a softer economy altogether which will be able to put an end to the restriction i don't want to have strict controls i don't want to have too much of rules and regulations i want to be free i want to open up i want to give the country the best of the best economic reforms to the various sectors possible so what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to open up I'm trying to shake up all the resources. I'm trying to shaking up all the sectors together, saying that this is the opportunity. Please make the best use of it. Though a few liberalization measures were introduced in 1980, way back, 15, 20 years back, when we are talking about the situation altogether, including on the export-import policy. Though there were not much of activity that happened because of the factor that of the technology upgradation that was needed, the export import policy coming into it. So these were all little bit comprehensive, but yet quite complicated. Also, we were not able to successfully take it forward. So let us study some of the important areas where the industrial sector, financial sector, tax reform, these are all the sector foreign exchange markets, which we really did a lot of effort in terms of liberalization. Our intention was that in the year 1980, that somewhere we have to build our technology, somewhere we have to make our country a stronger country for growth. But then at that point of time, we were technically challenged, we were also challenged from the financial aspect. So after 1991, we started understanding that the financial sector, the industrial sector and the services sector, these are the three sectors where we want to bring in a revolution, where we want to bring in better norms and conditions so that the system and the country starts growing up automatically so that is where we wanted to promote the concept of liberalization altogether now moving forward
So in India, the regulatory reforms, which I'm going to talk about, and the deregulation sector was enforced in the following way. Industrial licensing under which every entrepreneur had to get permission was one of the important thing government officials to start a firm or close a firm to decide the amount of goods that could be produced. So this is one of the mechanism that we were trying to enforce all about. The licensing that was done by an entrepreneur, we wanted to bring in a control. We wanted to bring in a regime through which we could probably move away from that. Private sector was not allowed in many industries. This was another D background. So that's why the deregulation of industrial sector, we wanted to abolish all these things. We never wanted the licensing. We never wanted the private sector to be demoralized or diminished altogether. Some goods could be produced only in the small scale industry. Again, that restriction of putting things saying that only A can be produced, B cannot be produced. We wanted to bring a control over that. Controls on price fixation and distribution of selected industrial product. Now, the pricing factor was also a matter of worry in the economy because if you start seeing that the selective pricing actually made an undervaluation of Indian products. So what we wanted is that we could bring in an open pricing system, an open pricing mechanism through which we will be able to see that the growth of the economy happens. So this is why we believed and we understood that at some point of time, we need to open up the economy even more better, even more positive altogether so that the economy can start doing up well. So we bought in certain deregulation, removing of licensing, opening of the private sectors, giving the industrial sectors even more importance to perform. Now moving forward. The industrial licensing was completely abolished. So we wanted to remove this factor altogether, except for certain categories like alcohol, cigarettes and hazardous chemical. We are not really much into it because those were the sectors that were kept by the government as a niche sector altogether. And some sectors like the aerospace and drugs and pharmaceuticals, we did not open them as soon as possible. Remaining all other sectors, we abolished the licensing factor. The only industries that were reserved were the public sector, especially in terms of the defense, atomic energy and railway transport. Now, if you look at them, at the current economy, these are the sectors which have been opened up by the government because for the defense sector, we have given a lot of importance. For the railway sector also, we are now talking about privatization. At that point of time, 25, 30 years back, we did not give importance. We restricted them because keeping them purely under the government control. So some of these sectors where we were not really opening up was the defense, the atomic energy sector and on the railway transport. Many goods that were produced by the small scale industry had now been de-reserved. So which means they also had a better value altogether. Now the market was allowed to determine the price this is what exactly I was trying to tell you that opening up of the price sector giving the market the importance to price an open sector where you could exchange your prices where you could exchange the value of goods and then find out what is the true price altogether promoted the economy to the next level altogether so this is very very important opening up of the price opening up of the private companies and sectors where they could bring their products display it to the world and say that this is the quality this is the standard of the Indian production moving forward we come to the conclusion of the first session known for the liberalization, privatization and globalization. I hope and believe that this session was interesting, informative and educative. In the next session, we will see some more reforms that happened in the areas of liberalization and globalization. Until then, stay tuned, stay blessed and stay enlightened forever. Thank you once again for joining me today.